spread around the world. And in fact, one of the issues that I think is important is to understand the fastest growing of the world right now in terms of human population is actually Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is now over 14 million people, which almost half of them live in dire slums. Lagos, Nigeria, 13.2 million people, same situation. Nairobi, Kenya. Go down the list here and you'll see that we these are really powder kegs in a sense. And if we think about the recent Ebola situation in West Africa with the three capital cities of Monrovia, Freetown, and Conakry combined, they are 4.2 million people combined. They, if they were a gas can waiting for a match, Ebola match to hit them, a place like Kinshasa is a gas tanker waiting for an Ebola match to hit it. And so you can get a sense that basically we do have challenges that we're going to deal with, and world population has a lot to do with that. You see some pictures there should give you a sense of what uh, these are from uh, Kinshasa, give you a sense of what we're dealing with. Then also I had a slide that was actually a graphical slide that would have moved, showing the 93,000 commercial airline flights a day. Those yellow dots you see there would all have moved through the every hour by the hour, and it becomes one big yellow map. And you get a sense, not just how the people who are traveling on those planes every day, but what's in the belly of those planes and how they move. The next piece, just to give you an underlying uh, kind of condition we have to deal with. When the United States and the U USSR decided to eliminate smallpox from the world, it was clearly a very monumental decision. And it worked because there were the conditions of smallpox where we had vaccine, we could re easily recognize cases, et cetera, et cetera. But in retrospect, what was really critical, there were two world powers in the 1960s, the USSR and the USA. And when those two countries decided to do anything, every other country in the world was a domino that fell behind them. And when those two countries agreed, it was agreed to today. Well, today, if we look at what's happening in the world, I don't know who a world power is or how you define it or who follows who for what. We look no further than the number of polio eradicators in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan that have been assassinated in the last several years, over 180. Just recently, a mother and her teenage daughter were killed for delivering polio vaccine uh, by, by ISIL. So it's a whole different world. And what you see here is the fragile state index from the fee, food for a uh, fund for peace. And in that map, you will see over 40 countries in the world are literally in fragile state status or completely uh, unknown who basically is in charge in a way that can get government policies done uh, effectively and safely. And so we have a new challenge today. We, we can't deliver public health the way we did 20 or 30 years or even 40 years ago. And now we have to understand that. So what is our public health response capability? Let me move to that. After the Ebola crisis of 2014-15, Everyone rushed on board to be a Monday morning quarterback, and I don't say that in a disparaging way. But we all have a natural inclination to want to figure out what happened, how we fix it, whether it was the World Health Organization itself looking at how it performed, the National Academy of Medicine in the United States brought together a group, issued a report, and even the groups at, uh, Hop or at uh, Harvard and the Linda School of Tropical Medicine put together a group, and everybody came up with the same conclusion. We are woefully unprepared. The same kind of conclusion we've been hearing over and over again, and I will just say, in many instances, these are some of the finest people at a place like the WHO who are basically hemmed in by the conditions such as no increase in dues for a decade, uh, for a lack of resources across the board, an authority situation where regional offices by the United States' own design when the World Health Organization was set up are in many cases stronger than the central Geneva office. But the bottom line is it's a broken system uh, that we have to fix. And we have only had marginal improvement in that. And I think one of the things that uh, I want to share with you in a most positive way is we've got to stop having all this happy talk. I have gone to too many hearings. I've gone to too many testimonies where you know, everybody puts their best foot forward. Now, you know, surely there's a lot of good work going on, and we should emphasize that point. But we have to illustrate the problems. We can't fix them. If we just cover them up, and I think, Senator Daschle, your earlier comments about that were right on the mark. You know, what is it that we need to do to fix the problem instead of just congratulating ourselves for what we've accomplished? To give you a sense of where we might go with this, uh, uh, looking at the, what I think is one of the biggest problems, I actually share with you the UN panel's health crisis assessment after the Ebola situation. And the panel chair from the United Republic of Tanzania wrote in that document, 
Following its extensive consultations, the panel notes that the high risk of major health crises is widely underestimated and the world's preparedness and capacity to respond is woefully insufficient. Future epidemics could far exceed the scale and devastation of the West Africa Ebola outbreak. The panel was very concerned to learn that the emergence of a highly pathogenic influenza virus, which could rapidly result in millions of deaths and cause major social, economic, and political disruption, is not an unlikely scenario. This was not said by some public health people that might be accused of trying to feather their budget nests. This was said by an objective leader of the world who looked at this, and I think we have to take that seriously. Next, you'll see a map that I shared with you that actually shows the population of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes in the Americas in 1930s, 1970, and 2015. This is an important measure of where we are today in public health preparedness and capability. Aedes aegypti is a mosquito that came over in the first slave ships from Africa, not native to the Americas. But today, it's a very important vector for diseases like dengue, chikungunya, zika, and yellow fever. It's a mosquito that is basically a household mosquito. It won't fly across an open street or an open field. It loves to grow in containers of water, little water dish, in dark areas. It resides during the day in the closets of your house. It loves to bite you from behind during the day when you don't even know it's doing it. It's not the swamp mosquito we see. It's not the kind of mosquito we think of with malaria. Why is this important? Because in the 1930s, you can see how widely distributed this was in the Americas. And at that time, the Pan American Health Organization and the Rockefeller Foundation decided, we're going to go gangbusters. We're going to go house by house, and we're going to eliminate this mosquito. Look where we were in the 1970s. We had almost accomplished that. And, you know, it's one of those things that when I went into the business in the 1970s, infectious disease epidemiology, I said, why are you going into this? This is horse and buggy days. You know, that you're just, we don't need horse and buggies anymore. Well, look where we're at in 2015. Not only is it much more widespread today, but it's actually in population levels that are anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times higher than recorded back in the 1930s. Now, what happened? Well, one of the first things is, is that once we accomplished what we had, we didn't finish the job, and we thought we were okay, and we ended. Public health is a never, ever ending investment need, and that's what's really important to understand. The next thing came, world conditions changed. Fortunately, there's enough people of age on this panel. You might remember, what was the famous line in The Graduate? What did they tell Benjamin to go into? Plastics. What happened was the world has become a plastic garbage dump. And with that, one little bottle cap like this is a very efficient way in throwing in a ditch to get water in it and to grow it. These are gypti mosquitoes. And so the plastic garbage of the world has suddenly made this a very fertile world for Aedes aegypti. Well, look where we're at there, and you can see the challenges we have today, and we talk about diseases like dengue, et cetera. The next slide is actually a cover shot of the New York Times story about what's happened in Venezuela. This is maybe the saddest story of all in public health. This is a trivia question, but what country in the world was the first country to eliminate malaria out of its populous regions? Venezuela. In the 1960s, Venezuela did it by its investment of money from, at that time, oil revenue coming in, its governance. Today, Venezuela has the highest level of malaria in the populous regions in the world. 400,000 new cases reported last year. What happened? Basically, again, infrastructure fell apart. Doctors, nurses, lawyers, and architects had no jobs. They went back out into the jungle regions and did illegal gold mining. With that, they picked up malaria, brought it back to the cities, and because of the fact that there are no treatments, drugs are very short supply, et cetera, this has now become, along with the mosquito residing in the urban areas, a, a horrible, horrible problem. The next slide is just a, a, a story about that, but actually today there's a story in the New York Times about this very issue, about just how bad Venezuela is. This is a stark reminder to us. It's not just what do we need to do to get better, it's what do we need to do to make sure we don't lose ground. And I worry desperately between these crises, we lose ground. You know, we'll have this momentary kind of excitement and, oh, we got to do something, and then it just goes out of the way. And that's why your panel is so important. You are, in a sense, the standard bearer for reminding us in this country, for that matter, the world, this risk doesn't go away, and it's only getting more complicated, and that's hard to hear. The next piece is my contribution to the art discussion today. For those that don't recognize this, this is the Battle of Waterloo. And I think we would be well to study events like this to understand why in public health we've got some challenges. This occurred in June 18th of 1815. As you know, at that time, Napoleon uh, was taking on with the French Empire, the United Kingdom, and Prussia. I, by the way, there's no reference 
to France today based on events here. This just is a story I use a lot. Um, Napoleon had a much larger force of experienced soldiers. They, they decided because of that they could attack at leisure. They waited on the weather until they had good weather. They assumed superior numbers and skill would prevail, and they had a poor understanding of the opponents, especially the Prussian troops based on past experience. Well, based on all the reasons why they should have won, they didn't win. And in fact, at that time, the French army was routed, Napoleon was placed in exile where he died. Napoleon had a set of expectations of how things would happen, and they didn't happen that way. And what we do far too often today is we make the assumptions we're okay, we're all ready to go until the next crisis happens, and then we realize we get routed. And we've got to stop that cycle, and we're going to talk more about what that and why. Well, let me move to what is a pandemic and why does it matter? The words matter in public health more than just the fact that they're definitions. In a book that I published last year with my co-author Mark Olshaker, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs, we actually tried to lay out a prioritization as to what do we really need to be most concerned about and why. And pandemics are worldwide epidemics. They occur around the world. Ebola was never a pandemic. Any of the diseases we talk about, even Zika, cannot be considered an a pandemic. But the two diseases that really today have the absolute potential to be a worldwide outbreak overnight, one is influenza, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The second, as you heard in the previous panel, is animal cold resistance. It's not a single bug outbreak. It's a growing collection of serious challenges we have because the microbes are just doing what they're naturally doing. They're evolving at microbial time every 20 minutes or so. And as a result of that, we are basically going from a pre-antibiotic era that our grandparents and great-grandparents lived in to an antibiotic era, and we are about to be approaching a post-antibiotic era. And at least you think that uh, this may be hyperbole, uh, a very, very well done report. I'd urge you to look at this, the AMR report done by uh, Sir Jim O'Neill, led by him in, great, in, in England, published uh, two years ago and supported by the Wellcome Trust, was by far the most exhaustive. Uh, look-see at antimicrobial resistance. And they concluded that by 2050, more people will be dying from antimicrobial resistant infections than dying from today's cancer and diabetes numbers. So it, we really have a challenge here. So I only point that out. It's not to take on any more here, but that is a pandemic problem. But if you look at this list here, let me just start with influenza and just briefly then make comments about a couple others that I think are key. Influenza, it's a disease that goes back to the literally almost prehistoric times. Well over 200 million years ago, influenza viruses took up residence in the guts of wild aquatic birds. Ironically, chickens didn't even come along for another 100 million years and then got involved with the whole thing. This is not a virus that in birds typically causes illness or at the time surely infected humans and caused a problem. However, over evolutionary time, it changed. And it turns out that these viruses, which are native to the guts of these wild birds, basically can genetically change enough so that they can infect other animal species. And in this case, we are one of them. How it does it most often is through what we call reassortment or mixing of genes. The influenza virus is a very promiscuous virus that will willingly share its genes with any other influenza virus that's in the same cell. One of the things that makes that happen are animals like pigs. Pigs actually have receptor sites for both the bird viruses and the human viruses. When they get together, they can create a brand new human virus. And this is where the term swine flu came up and why we're so concerned. You know about the great influenza uh, center. You mentioned it this morning, the 1918 epidemic. There are many people who think, well, that was a one-off. You know, never will happen again. Let me take you back. Hippocrates described influenza pandemics. If you go back to the 1600s, there were at least 10 major influenza pandemics, and even historically, even more than that. What, that. what is occurring there is when a new influenza virus gets out of the animal population, it gets into humans, and for the first time, humans can transmit it to other humans. And then that starts the whole cycle, and then it's no longer dependent on the animals. In 1918, as you correctly stated, Senator, there's an estimated anywhere from 50 to 100 million people died. Think of this. This virus did not get to the French battlefield, a European theater, until the very end of the war, and yet eight times as many U.S. soldiers died from influenza in Europe than died from a whole entire three years on the battlefield. So it was a very, very uh, uh, serious situation. Where did it start? We don't know. It may have been in the United States. But there's a graph here I want to point out for you that is uh, it's age distribution of deaths from influenza and pneumonia at Boston. What you'll see there on the bottom are the ages 0 to 9, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49 and up. 
What you see is from uh, uh, September 12th to September, or, uh, 1912 to 16, for September, October, and November is the historic data for the city of Boston. At that time, on the left, you'll note deaths per 100. So in other words, per 1,000 population, there were 300 deaths as such um, from, in young kids. That's about 0.3%. If you look, then it drops dramatically, and it's not till you get older. But look at that second bar. There is September through October of 1918, where now the numbers are thousands. Three percent of kids died. Where it hit young adults, almost six percent of young adults just died in those two months. To give you a sense, more children died from, swine, from this influenza outbreak in September, October, and November of 1918 than died for the next 25 years combined in this country. It gives you a sense of the impact this disease had. Now, can this happen again? Surely. The next slide is actually data that we generated at our center, which gives you a sense of previous pandemics and the most recent one. And this is the mean age of deaths. And what you'll see is if you've seen one pandemic, you've seen one pandemic. You don't know what it means for others. In 1918, the mean age of deaths was 27 years. Average life expectancy was 56 years. Then in 1957 and 68, two different flu viruses, H2N2 and H3N2, appeared. And look at those. Average age of deaths were 65 and 62 years, respectively, with life expectancies of 69 and 71. They almost mirrored life expectancy, meaning it really affected the older population. But look at 2009. While there were fewer deaths and it didn't have the same devastating impact that 1918 did, the average age of deaths in the 2009 cases was 40 years. Life expectancy was 79. When you actually adjust on life expectancy, the cases that died in 2009 were younger than the cases that died in 1918. So depending on which flu virus spins out and what it does, the next one could be a hell of a problem, or it could be another you know, kind of one where it's uh, seasonal flu and steroids. We don't know. But we can tell you with certainty that these are going to continue to happen, just like hurricane, earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis occur. The next slide actually is a cartoon that I had in a Excuse new me a journal second. medicine. Why, why are they going to continue to happen? What's that? It's an obvious question, but why are they why are they going to continue to happen? Actually, if you give me a couple more slides, I'll give you exactly right. that. Okay? okay, thank you. But thanks for that lead-in. Um, this slide just gives you a sense of it's. This is called a, a cytokine storm, and flu viruses can kill you one of several ways. One is is that basically, and what we often think of is it damages your lungs sufficiently that you then did a secondary bacterial infection and you die from that. Well, you'd argue if I had antibiotics, I should be able to do well with that. A cytokine storm is basically an immune response that is out of control in the individual who has influenza, and the virus causes that. We can't do much better today with cytokine storms than we did back in 1918. We surely have some better medicine. We have some machines that can help. But generally speaking, the outcome is very poor. So we're still very vulnerable to flu today in many ways as we were in 1918. Now, Senator, to answer your question directly, the next slide is an article that came out in February of 2015 from the World Health Organization saying, wake up world, something is happening with flu viruses in birds. Very different. Even though we didn't have virus uh, identification abilities till the early, mid, early to mid 1900s, what we had basically is a lot of records on animal and bird health. And so when large flocks died, even in the 1800s and 1700s, we knew about it. Today, th what we're seeing is incredibly different. And what this document did is tried to get people to wake up. And if you go to the third page where it says uh, February 2015, since the start of 2014. Now remember, this is February of 2015, 13 months. Since the start of 2014, the Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, has been notified of 41 H5 and H7 outbreaks, a type of flu virus we're concerned about in birds that could go to humans. In birds involving seven different viruses in 20 countries in Africa, the Americas, Asia, Australia, Europe, and the Middle East, several novel viruses that have emerged and spread in wild birds or poultry only in the past two years. Let me fast forward to address your question. Imagine if I could restate this today and say since the start of 2014 and bring it current to 2018, which is a slightly longer time. I'd read it by saying, since the start of 2014, the OIE has been notified of thousands of H5 and H7 outbreaks in birds involving at least 14 different viruses in 67 different countries. Something has happened literally in the last three years. And 
our group is very involved with influenza research can tell you this is not an artifact of just better surveillance. So what's happening is in part, we believe, because of the growing number of poultry in the world, which is the primary poultry source. To give you an example, every month, 125 million chickens are grown in the peri-urban region of just Shanghai to feed Shanghai. From the time a chicken is hatched until it's on your plate is 35 days. So every month, 125, 125 million new chickens are born. That's just one city. So what we've done is we've really altered the animal-human environment in such a way that we've greatly enhanced the opportunities for these viruses in the birds to spin out and get to humans. I liken it to the fact if you and I went to the casino and we had one throw an hour, what are our chances of winning? What if we had an electronic ability to throw a thousand throws every second? Guess who probably is going to win first? What's happened is the birds are now throwing electronic casino throws and we have to understand that this is going to be a challenge for us. And so Yes, uh, why are we going to have more? Because we just are under much more pressure. Now, this next one is an article that uh, our group published in The Lancet in 2011, which was one of the least popular things I've ever done in my life. Um, it was an article that basically said, hold on, we have grossly overestimated how well our flu vaccines work. Not by necessarily deception or intent. We didn't understand what we didn't understand. It turned out flu vaccines really got their genesis in World War II. And our Department of War was the primary force behind that because everybody remembered 1918. And they thought, what would happen if this were to occur again? And so today's flu vaccines we have are really a byproduct of the Department of War work from World War II. And many of the original premises of how they might work, even the technology we use today, the same antigen that we use is there. Well, when we went in and looked at it, we found out, no, they don't work nearly as well. And these are the reasons why. And people didn't want to hear that because and so somehow we were putting down flu vaccine. It was actually quite to the contrary. What we were calling for is new and better flu vaccines. In the next page, you'll see this is a uh, article that's on the current CDC website, Seasonal Influenza Vaccine Effectiveness 2005-2017. And to CDC's credit, they have really tried to now lay out as clearly as possible just how well these vaccines are working. And on the next page, if you look to the second to the right column, it's what's called overall VE or vaccine effectiveness. So how, much, how many times does it work? And you'll see starting in 2004, let me just read down this list. These are by year, 10%, 21%, 52%, 37%, 41%, 56%, 60%, 47%, 49%, 52%, 19%, 48%, 40%, 40, and 36 And this year, it's somewhere in the 20s. That's not what we would consider an outstanding response to a vaccine. And it really is a clarion call for why we need new and better flu vaccines uh, immediately. The next slide actually shows even our ability to produce the vaccine is limited by the current cap production capacity for largely growing it in chicken eggs. These are data that our center generated looking at the 2009 pandemic. What you see is the blue line is what we call influenza-like illness surveillance. And on the far right vertical bar, you see the percent of visitors coming to doctor's offices by month reporting influenza-like symptoms. And you can see that the second wave of the pandemic clearly peaked in early to mid-October. Look when the vaccine arrived, despite every effort to get it there as quickly as possible. Red light sirens all went off in April of 2009 to get it done. By the time that the wave had come down, we still only had about 45, 000, or 45 million doses of vaccine into the American public, of which many of them went to kids who required two doses. So it wasn't even like we had that many people vaccinated. If you look at worldwide, we're lucky, and I say lucky, if we come up with the best guest estimate of less than 5% of the population of the world had access to flu vaccine by the end of the second wave. That's the capability. So we desperately need to change that. And it was the reason on January of this past year, I, Mark and I had another op-ed piece in the New York Times, we're not ready for the flu pandemic. And we did two things. We predicted, number one, that it was going to be a bad seasonal flu year, which it turned out to be. And number two, we said the vaccine wasn't going to work that well, which it didn't. I mean, I don't, you don't have to be real smart anymore to predict some of these things. And I think the point being is, is it's time for us to take a step back and say, what do we really need to do? Why? Because we could have a 1918, and I'll let your minds begin to get around that and imagine what it would be like today if that were to happen. In 2012, our center, the next page, produced a report called The Compelling Need for Game-Changing Influenza Vaccines. 
we found out that number one, public health was its own biggest enemy. We had so oversold vaccines, we had taken any private market incentive out of trying to get a new vaccine or a better vaccine. And we had basically made it a sense of, you know, just get your flu shot every year and we'll be okay. And in this report, however, we laid out a very clear pathway for how we could get new and better flu vaccines. And to put this into contrast, the next slide, which I don't know if any of you recognize that individual, that's Secretary Margaret Heckler, former Secretary of HHS, Secretary Shalala. Um, and she had a very infamous statement on April 23rd, 1984, in which she at that point uh, in a press conference said that we'd likely have an AIDS vaccine in three years. Well, I spent the next several years again in the doghouse because I was quoted frequently in the media saying, I did not believe we'd have an effective AIDS vaccine in my lifetime. And it was because to me, it was like beam me up Scotty technology, given how we know the virus infects people. I stand here today in 2018 and say, I don't think we'll have an effective AIDS vaccine in my lifetime. Now counter that with what I'm about to tell you. So it's not just that it's a happy talk. I actually honestly believe we have the technology and the growing information to come up with a very effective flu vaccine that might be given once every 10, 20, 30 years and protect against a variety of different strains. So why haven't we gotten there yet? Because again, we've lacked the commitment in, deal in dealing with this. Recent editorials in a number of journals, Nature Medicine, et cetera, have all come up with uh, the idea that we need to do this. Even the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases has said that it has a strategy to universal flu vaccine. But the problem with this is nobody has really put the grand plan together yet, meaning NIAD, which is surely cutting edge science for the world, covers just that very beginning part of a flu vaccine. This is going to have to take an entire from cradle to grave, private sector, how will they be involved, how will we involve the world, how will we price it. It's going to take a lot of work to do that. And to give you some sense of that, Today, if we look at HIV vaccine research, which I just told you about, we spend over a billion dollars a year and a half for the last eight years on HIV vaccine research. I wouldn't take a penny of it away. Last year as a federal government, we spent less than $70 million on that. Now, along comes Senator Markey, who in part tied, because we had discussions with him to our New York Times op-ed piece, proposes a new legislation in February for basically a billion dollars, 200 million a year for the next five years. And it was the first real move by the US government to really make this a high priority. Well, in the next slide, you'll see finally on March 23rd, the president signed the bill, but it was basically for $100 million one time. Well, that's like buying five foot of rope for people who are all drawn in 30 feet out. It's a good start, but it's not gonna do it. And what we have to understand, we have to finish this job and it's gonna take it. And that's where the next slide, and I promise this is my last uh, uh, outside uh, effort at other events. This is the Manhattan Project. People really, really misunderstand what happened in the Manhattan Project. All they think of was a bomb. And in fact, this is by far one of the finest examples of project management and prioritization of goals of any effort ever conducted by humans. You may agree or disagree with this outcome. It began modestly in 1939, but grew to employ more than 130,000 people and had an annual budget of $2 billion. Today, that would be $22 billion a year. The research and production took place at more than 30 sites across the US, UK, and Canada. And how did it all get held together? Not by world famous physicists, Nobel Prize laureates. It was held together by a major general, Leslie Groves, who was in the Manhattan District Office of the US Army Corps of Engineers, and who in the pre-computer days was an absolute master at project management. Everything was done on time. Everything was at the right place for the right people, whether it was the physicists or the construction people. And it was all about setting a goal and project management and give pride in the resources. Today, we need a Manhattan Project for flu vaccine. Short of that, I'm afraid I'll be back here five years from now having the same discussion with you. Well, we're getting there. We just bought five more feet of rope. We're now at 10 feet. Pretty soon, we'll get out to 30. So I think this is, this is key. Let me just move quickly. Why does the 21st century matter? This next slide actually, which I was very proud to share with you, I pulled off this morning. Every hour on the hour, all 63,000 fast sailing vessels in the world report their location and weather conditions. This was from this morning where they're all at. See all those red dots on there? This is now the warehouse of the world. This is where all the goods that we count on every day are at. A fast freighter today from outside Be the port of Beijing to Long Beach is nine days. And it is in, in 
the uh, harbor for about 20 to 24 hours where it unloads, reloads, refuels, and it's gone again. So if anything were to affect this, I can guarantee you we'd have problems. There's the next, uh, next slide. I, I, this is a trivia question for each of you up here. How many washing machines do you think you can put on that ship? Huh. Anyone want to guess? Guess some really... Who do, one million washing machines per, per journey. Wow. This is what we're counting on today for what moves things around the Wait world. I get home and ask my wife that question. <laughs> well, I'm happy to send you the actual slide if you'd like it, okay? Actually, with the tariffs, you're not going to have any. <laughs> and, thank you. That's right. Well, that's going to get to be another point in a minute. <clears throat> so the whole point of this is we don't understand the complex interdependent infrastructures are likely to fail in a cascading fashion during a severe pandemic. Remember, a pandemic is affecting all people around the world about the same time. What would result in unprecedented employee absenteeism in all regions of the world? Global critical infrastructures are most vulnerable to cascading impacts of a pandemic, including public health, medical care delivery, food, transportation, pharmacy, cyber, manufacturing, and power. All of those are highly, highly vulnerable. Well, I show you here, next several slides are news scans from our website and other news sources, surprisingly, or at least surprised by, the fact that suddenly when we had a a uh, Hurricane Maria, Category 5 hurricane, wiped through the Puerto Rico, that we're suddenly going to have a shortage of IV bags for the world. I gave a talk four years before this, I still have the slides, in which I said, you know, the next Category 5 through Puerto Rico is going to really make a mess for us with IV bags, because 70% of the world's production is on that island. And anybody could have predicted this. And so why are we so surprised when it happened? And you'll see, we still today are trying to recover, because we don't have worldwide capacity to make IV bags and the medical. Further down, you'll see an article called China RX. It's a book cover, actually. I urge everyone on this committee to read this. It's recently published by Rosemary Gibson, who is at the Hastings Institute and an, an associate editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association. What this does is shares with you what's happened to our pharmaceutical industry today. Virtually almost all generic drugs are made in China. There is no surplus supply chain. There's nothing that basically makes it so we will not run out. We did a study several years ago and surveyed a group of world famous PharmDs in all areas of medicine. We said, what are those life-saving drugs you have to every day or people die? Not cancer drugs, not most antibiotics, surely not lifestyle drugs. What's on the crash cart in the emergency room? We came up with 30 drug drug categories. 29 of those drugs were made in China, all generic, no stockpiles, just-in-time delivery, major shortages. One, insulin, was actually made in Scandinavia, of which I'll come back to in a minute. To give you a sense of what I'm talking about, the next slide is a summary of emergency room visits in the United States. What you'll see here is there were 11.2 million emergency room visits last year, of which 1.8 million actually resulted in critical care admission. It gives you an idea just how sick these people are. Well, in the next pages, which I wish I could share the audience with you, with you is data from Boundtree. Boundtree is the pre-hospital supplier of supplies for all the United States. So if you're in ambulance services, et cetera, you buy almost everything you get from Boundtree. This is a list, and note in the upper right-hand corner, April 19th. This comes out weekly. All these drugs are an absolute short supply are not available right now. We have crisis settings in many institutions around the country where we can't get needed drugs. And if you look at the dates for many of those, they're not going to be filled literally for months to years. And it goes to the list. 180 drugs here, okay? And many of them are key things like something as simple as atropine. Then you even get into the next level, which is also from Boundtree, and you'll see that, in fact, we have the same phenomena here with the, all the pain medications. Look at morphine. Morphine right now in this country is in terrible short supply. And then you finally get down to the next level, which is the IV bags, which basically you'll see is what I've already talked about. This is the kind of world we live in today where anything that causes even a hiccup in places where we actually manufacture and receive critical goods is going to cause us. Now, what happened in West Africa was Ebola was not a problem in the sense of supply chains. We had a slight interruption of cocoa and a slight interruption of rubber. But if this were hit China, were hit other places of the world, we are completely beholden to them. 
If you look in our country today, next slide, about 2.7% of the population has some level of immunodeficiency, which are on any number of drugs for that reason. Next, you'll see how many people here in terms of diabetes. Right now, there are 14 million Americans that are taking insulin every day. Think, again, where they're going to get that if we have a major shutdown. And then finally, kidney dialysis. In 2014, there were 118,000 people in the U.S. that started treatment for basically long-term kidney disease. There were 662,000 who were living on chronic dialysis or with a kidney transplant. Now, today, do you know where your, chronic, where your dialysis distillate comes from? Not the United States. So you see how vulnerable we are. And all of these issues. So if a pandemic of influenza were to hit the United States today, in some ways, the pandemic could just be the first of our worries. It's all the collateral damage that would occur. And that's going to happen around the world. And we are doing nothing. We are doing nothing to deal with that. We are more vulnerable today than we were five years ago. And we're more vulnerable five years ago than we were 10 years ago. So one of the challenges is, what are the indirect impacts? And this will affect our military. This will affect our world leaders. We have to deal with that. So what are the challenges for the future? Let me just wrap up. First of all, I want to emphasize what the previous panel said. I absolutely do believe that the dual use research of concern and what's happening there is a major challenge. I was a charter member of the NSAVB starting in 2005 to 2014. And I can only say the best we did was shed some light on the issue, but largely kick the can down the road. We don't really have a way. And I think Senator or Governor Ridge, you said it well, if the good guys are going to do it, what does a piece of paper mean? So how do you actually verify? How do you actually know what's going on? You're right on the mark. We look at the issue, there are clearly benefits of gain of function work. We have to understand that we can't just say go away, but how do we do that? Do we publish the results? And you can see the next paper is the one that came up, we mentioned earlier, about the development uh, of a new horsepox virus, de novo. You know, some of us had talked about that several years ago. It was going to happen, and nobody wanted to believe it. Again, it was that bad news. Don't believe it. If you can make horsepox, you sure in hell can make smallpox. And today we have to know that who might want to make it. You know, it doesn't have to be a, 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 a state actor. It could be somebody who just has enough experience who also has a, some element of mental illness that could try it just to see. Are we prepared? Think of smallpox. We're very comfortable right now with the fact that we have enough smallpox vaccine in this country, and it's one of the legacies of the post-9-11, of which uh, Governor Ridge was a key party to this, that we now today have that. And I'm very, very proud to say we can. But what if this starts somewhere else in the world? Are we going to give our vaccine away to try to stop it? Or are we going to say, no, we're going to hold it? Because we don't want to possibly run out of doses in time for us. We have lots of challenges yet that we haven't really addressed. In terms of looking at what uh, we also need to consider for the future, think of this. This, this, and I'm talking about this in open public, but this was because it was well known inside the community. This past year, we had a major plague outbreak in Madagascar, the island thereof. This is caused, you know, by the classic bacteria that causes plague, and most often it's what we call a sylvatic cycle. It starts in animals, people get exposed from fleas, etc and they develop what's bubonic plague, where they get basically the infection in their lymph nodes, et cetera. Still a bad thing. But occasionally, you can develop pneumonic plague. It gets into your lungs. And when humans develop non pneumonic plague, they are now capable, in many instances, of transmitting it via the air to someone else. But we had literally the largest outbreak of pneumonic plague in modern history on Madagascar this past year. And it was really a very difficult outbreak to bring under control. In a sense, thank God it was on an island, because it literally did mean it was more contained. But what was really challenging here amongst many of my colleagues, the only way to really stop pneumonic plague is to treat the people who are infected or they die. If you treat them, they can't transmit to others. This bacteria was sensitive to the key antibiotics that we had to treat it with. But we can tell you that even a junior scientist in many labs could have engineered resistance in that bacteria overnight. And had that happened, we wouldn't have had any weapons to stop it beyond the basic kind of respiratory protection control. And now here we are in 2018, we're talking about pneumonic plague. That's what we wrote, read about in the 1800s. So this again reminds us of how vulnerable we are. Finally, let me just say, where are we going in the world of future vaccines? 
I was very involved with setting up and supporting a group called the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which you're familiar with, CEPI. This is the group that the Wellcome Trust and other countries have come, and they just announced basically an award of up to $56 million to advance DNA vaccines against loss of fever and MERS, a very noble thing. But the effort is to get it to a 2A status, meaning of a whole licensure process to phase three phase licensure. And the next slide, what you see is the market dynamics for developing flu vaccines, but it's the same thing. The Valley of Death is that period between phase two into phase three in early commercialization where most vaccines or drugs fail. We don't have a system to take CEPI vaccines and move them to phase three and licensure in a business model. And the reason I point this out to you, because I've had a very rude awakening myself in the past year. Our center was charged by the WHO with leading the R&D roadmap blueprint for vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics for a number of major diseases. So we've been charged with the whole world bringing these together. It's been Ebola, Nipah, uh, loss of fever, et cetera. And over and over and over again, what we keep hearing, it's not about the basic science. There's no business model. There is no business model. Why are we going to invest millions and millions and millions of dollars and maybe at the end of the rainbow have a pot of five or $10 million in revenue? We have to fix that because we can do all the upfront work we want, but if there's not something on the backside, you know, imagine if today we went out and wanted to buy aircraft carriers by saying basically, you know, We'll help you figure out the basic design, but after that, you're on your own, and good luck you're going to sell it to. And maybe we might buy them, maybe we won't. We wouldn't get aircraft carriers made. So we have to bring that kind of intense project management, goal setting, and prioritization to these. Finally, let me just say uh, there was an article in today's, uh, yesterday's paper on the U.S. stockpile. This is a great, great thing, and I think that I give the U.S. government great credit for how it's done this. But after what I just shared with you, just know that that stockpile is just a start. If people are dying because they can't get dialyzed, or people are dying because they can't get insulin, or people are dying because they can't get any other you know, life-saving drugs they need, that stockpile is not going to have much impact. So part of the challenge we have is how do we bring the entire pharmaceutical world to clear? And so let me just conclude by saying, as Sir Winston Churchill once said, it's no use saying we're doing our best. You've got to succeed in doing what is necessary. And I think we take such credit for doing our best and it's not a bad thing, but know that it's not sufficient. And if we're really going to address this, and this is why we're so pleased that your panel is are addressing these issues, because you may be right now one of the lone voices out there bringing a comprehensive and proactive agenda to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. That was great. Well, uh, we don't shrink from the challenge that you've made, so... I guess in some sense we welcome it. Uh, we, we probably have 15 or 20 minutes for some uh, questioning. L let me just ask you to expand a little bit or, or contract in a way on this very powerful argument for a universal flu vaccine, particularly uh, because you think it's in reach uh, scientifically, technologically. So, and I must say that unlike the medical countermeasures where the pharma industry always seems to say, well, we don't really know there'll be a market for it here, is pretty clearly a big market for a, for a vaccine. Everybody will want to get the flu shot that works. So what, what is it money? Is it the Markey bill or, or is it something else? How, how, how do we get there quicker than we will get there now? Well, first of all, we have several issues. One is the current pharmaceutical market basically enjoys an annual market, you might say, that's almost guaranteed. And so why would you want to cannibalize that? Right. Okay, so we've got to give them an incentive. Even though it's not working very well, as you've uh, well, shown us. We still give it. We yeah. still pay the money for it. Right. The second thing, though, is the fact that this is going to take us a lot of resources. You know, and I just shared the number with you on HIV, and we're still doing that. This is in the billions of dollars to get there. So at the end of the time when we have a licensed product, we're using it worldwide, what is going to be the cost recovery on that? Who's going to pay for it? And if it's many billions of dollars to get this achieved, which to me is a very cheap investment on the cost of not doing it to the world, who's going to obviously pay back that billions and billions? Of so would we afford $125 or $130 immunization for flu once a time? That has to be worked out. Now, I we can make the case that it surely is going to be cost-effective long run. 
But the point of it is, we don't even have that kind of leadership right now to make these cases. But Michael, we've done this. We did it in AIDS drugs. We did it in vaccines. We know how to put that business plan together. If you do volume and then you negotiate at a discounted price and then you get the countries in the world to pool their resources together, we've organized it at the international level to get this done. So I, I, I understand your argument. We haven't done it yet, but it's not like we haven't done it in a in a whole set of areas. Amen. <laughs> That's exactly our point, is, is that this needs to be done. This is the leadership that would be part of that Manhattan Project we're talking about. You know, make the case for why it can and should be done. But no one's stepped up to the plate yet. You know, again, I give the NIH great credit for what they're doing. But if you look, none of that's in the plan. I mean, they're concentrated on that upfront science. There is nobody leading this effort anywhere that did exactly what you did so successfully with HIV. That's what we need. That's where your group can help call that out. Will do. Other questions from the panel? First of all, I just wish that everybody in the room yeah. had the benefit of, uh, of uh, seeing your extraordinarily impressive deck. I, I think this is, this is we had great decks today, I'll tell you that, <laughs> uh, all the way around. And I just, you spent almost your entire time talking about the natural threat, and for good reason. And you know, the historical nature of it, how we ought to look at it, the fact that we're just not prepared. Uh, can I assume from that that that's where you think our priority really ought to lie as we look at how we devote our resources and how we organize ourselves? Is it, <clears throat> is it, do we look at both the national security and the natural implications of threat the same, or do we do what, what your presentation seems to imply, put our priorities in line and really look at this natural threat first? Well, thank you, Senator. That's goes really to the point you made earlier this morning, which I agree completely with. Is it one or the other? It shouldn't be. But until we make a decision to fund these efforts at the level they need to be funded, we're going to be cannibalizing one for the other. And I think we're asking the wrong question. You know, why are we cannibalizing these as opposed to why are we not doing? You know, and again, I'm not a defense expert, and I would never for a moment suggest that. But I just, as a rational person, sit here and say 700 and some billion dollars a year 11 billion dollars a year, but in the end, as I described to you, it could happen with all the drugs, et cetera, we have a pandemic. You wanna create chaos, deaths, mortalities. Just look at this. And why are we not understanding the investment in this would be, and we did that with HIV. We did that with the issue around, uh, uh, you know, a min number, like we're doing it right now with HIV vaccine. So part of it is, we just have to get our priorities right. So I don't think, my emphasis was more because this part doesn't get told much, but as I pointed out in my book that I wrote in 2000, I've been on the edge of this. Um, you know, l let me just tell you, I mean, to this day, the most, probably most moving moments of my life. I got called in February of, of 1999, and I had served as an advisor to His Majesty King Sudana Jordan on bioterrorism issues. And I got a call from the Jordanian embassy and said, His Majesty wants to see you right now. So I thought he must be in the United States somewhere. He was at his uh, state in Ascot, outside of London. I literally, when the same clothes I went to work in was on a flight to London, I got picked up early in the morning, driven to the house. He got up in his robe. Uh, Queen Noor came down. I hadn't slept, still in the same clothes. And for five hours, he grilled me about smallpox, grilled me about smallpox. And I mean, I'll never forget that. Well, he, several weeks later, he wrote a very famous letter, which just missed his brother as the regent or heir apparent, appointed his son. But the whole letter was really about smallpox. I knew he knew something. I mean, the people in this room know, intelligence-wise, we don't know what he knew. But I'll never, ever for a moment walk away without thinking that, you know, and he died four weeks later. I'll never walk away thinking he didn't know something. So I don't have to be reminded how severe this could be. It's just a matter, I think, we have to put it into our perspective. Thank you very much. Um, a phenomenal presentation. I'm sorry we couldn't put it on the screen for the audience. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the panel would agree with you. You need leadership. It's both political, but also from the medical sector and the like. Yep. And ideally, you'd want more money. I get all that. But let's just put the comparison of defense and uh, CDC aside. We know we need hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, right? 
Are there research programs going on? Let's say this funding is static. Say we freeze everything. Are there research projects going on within federal facilities today on the on related issues that are more important than this? But if you had to stop at CDC or stop some of the research that's going on out there, are you saying everything else we're doing in government takes precedence over this? I'm not. I'm not looking for a. Uh, no, I. I, 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 I I'm what I'm trying to say is, I'm you know, not smart enough to this say. This seems to be as as critical. We we've, we've been talking about this all the time. We're many of us are more concerned about Mother Nature throwing something at us uh, before Al Qaeda does, and so this is uh, one of those things that are really troubling to us. And you talked about leadership. There is none. You talk about making a priority. There is none. So within the existing funding stream, because you you operate in and out of that, how do you make this more of a priority? Well, it's not a CDC issue. Hmm? It's an I'm sorry, it's an NIH issue. NIH, yeah. Well, yeah. I, think, I think there are two pieces to this. You One is, I would agree right. with you that, in Hold fact, on. you know, you know, basically, we have to look at this as not just what kills you. I mean, what kills us versus what hurts us versus what worries us versus what scares us can all be different. I mean, we literally almost brought down the U.S. Postal Service, as you know so well, yep. with a few cases yeah. of anthrax. And anthrax, And so, so part of it, we also have to factor that in. There are going to be some diseases that are just going to cause such a calamity that, again, the impact are going to be so high they have to be prioritized. So I think this is part of what I'd come back to. So, yes, there is research, but I think the problem is we don't have a business model. Why are we sitting here? We don't have, why do we not have an Ebola-prepared Africa right now? We have a vaccine that has been shown to be highly effective, and we could be vaccinating healthcare workers, burial team members, taxi cab drivers voluntarily. So as many rods are in the reaction now as, as could be. But why? Because we don't have a major push to get this thing completed because what's the pot at the end of the tunnel? There's nothing. And, and so I think that's the challenge. We have to create the business model too. Imagine if you had to be an aircraft carrier contractor and you were selling them to other companies. Nobody would buy them. It's a government. So this is a role that government, for the sake of the public, has to take on. And so to answer your question, I don't know all the other research going on, that, yeah. but I would say the chances of this happening are absolute. It's going to happen. Yeah. And, and so we're going to, you know, as the old oil fram commercial once said, you can pay me now or you'll pay me later. Yeah. I, used to have a friend, I used to have a friend that says, exploit the inevitable. Yeah. Exactly. This is going to happen. We have to figure out a way to exploit it. Exactly. I think, I think what we've come to feel uh, as we've gone on with our work it's not that we're not worried about a bioterrorist attack, but an infectious disease uh, pandemic uh, will come, and it's possible it'll kill a lot of people, a lot more than a bioterrorist attack will. So, in other words, they're both worries, but this is um, the potential for devastation here is well, great. And the strength of this argument is that it will disrupt the economy. Yeah, huge. There's a there. The business case is not simply the business case to put together the right stream, but it's also it will totally disrupt disrupt the international uh, economy. Yeah, I mean, as you pointed out, this could happen in China, not have any incidents over here. A little hard to imagine that. And it could still disrupt, our, it would obviously disrupt our economy because of the impact of, of the trade. So um, anyway, thank you. You've been, uh, pro, you've been a provocateur. Yeah. My job, thank you. Herb. Thank well you. Well done, well done. Come thank back you. again. <laughs> okay, next panel uh, on transnational biological